Excellent. Um, to panelists watching, I, again, if, if you are seeing a, um, just the speaker talking, or if you're speaking, a, if you see a, a bunch of little squares with all of our heads in them, could somebody out there watching let me know what you are seeing right now? Right now I'm hoping it's a bunch of little heads. Five heads, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Very good. If you're watching on a small screen, sometimes you need to swipe to see everybody who's on there. Um, but typically you get to see uh, see the group. Well, welcome everybody. We are just at our, oh, I'm getting a bit of an echo. Is, is there anyone on our panel got there? How about we have folks on our panel mute themselves right now? Okay. And let's see if that fixes. Okay. I feel like that's a little bit better. Good. Thank you. We'll get we'll get you back up. Don't worry. All right. Welcome to the Thursday. Oh, sorry, it's Tuesday. Welcome to the Tuesday, April 14th edition of RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I hope you're keeping well and staying optimistic. I'm coming to you from my home on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people in Esquimalt, British Columbia. Like many of you, the staff of the museum has been asked to work at home during this pandemic. And in this series, we are exploring what that looks like. We will visit with members of our curatorial and collection staff and discover how they do their work how their work might be reflected in their homes, what they're working on now, and in today's case, who they're working with and talking to. Today's presenter is Dr. Victoria Arbor, the Curator of Paleontology at the Royal BC Museum. Today, she has invited some of her colleagues from around Canada to join us here to talk about what's new in Canadian paleontology. We have Derek Larson from the Philip J. Curry Muse Dinosaur Museum, Hilary Madden from Carleton University, and Ashley Reynolds from the University of Toronto. Welcome, everybody. Perhaps uh, I will soon get you, you've all kindly muted yourselves because we were having some feedback. But let's have a little go around and have each of you briefly describe your research interests, what big questions you're thinking about, the types of animals you study, or the geological time periods. And Victoria, why don't we start with you? Sure, I'll unmute myself here. Um, so I'm Victoria Arbor, I'm Curator of Paleontology at the Royal BC Museum. And uh, my favorite group of dinosaurs to work on are the armored dinosaurs called ankylosaurs, but I've also been having a lot of fun learning about another group called leptoceratopsids, which are little cousins of uh, animals like triceratops. Um, so I've been really interested in things like the evolution of armor and weaponry and how ankylosaurs are found around the world through space and time. Uh, but now that I'm in British Columbia, I'm really interested in finding more British Columbia dinosaurs because we really don't know a lot about them. And so my field work for the last year and hopefully this summer, but maybe next summer, uh, is focusing on uh, the, the dinosaurs up north in British Columbia. And I'll share a couple of photos later on. Great. Well, how about we pass that same question over to Hillary? Sure. Hi there. So I'm an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Carleton University. And uh, most of the time when I'm in the field, I'm in the Carboniferous. So we're talking about uh, rocks that are about 300 plus million years old. And um, the part that's most interesting to me about this time period and why I actually spend most of my time down there in the Carboniferous is we're basically looking at some of the earliest phases of the invasion of land by uh, limbed vertebrates, so animals with arms and legs as opposed to fins and flippers. <laughs> uh, and so basically some of the big questions that we're interested in, in in my lab are what do these animals look like in the earliest phases? and uh, how rapidly were they adapting to the environment. The terrestrial realm is completely new uh, to many of these groups. And so basically, how quickly were they adapting and what exactly were they doing? So we see our earliest members of reptiles, our earliest members of our lineage, the synapsids, as well as many of the earliest uh, pioneering amphibians on the terrestrial realm. Derek, up there in Wembley, Alberta, how about you? 
Hello, I'm Derek Larson. I'm the assistant curator at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. Um, I study a number of different things, but uh, one of my focuses is actually working on the relationship between diet and tooth shape in several different fossil animals, including uh, theropod dinosaurs like this velociraptor here. So looking, for instance, at the, the shape of the teeth and how that might be related to uh, diet, uh, comparing that to some modern animals, such as the modern Komodo dragon. Uh, I've also been, for the last few years, focusing um, my studies in northern Alberta, uh, really trying to expand our knowledge of the diversity of the uh, dinosaurs and the animals that were living uh, in northern Alberta in the late Cretaceous period um, in this region, which is very fossiliferous, um, but relatively inaccessible and, and seldom explored. Excellent. And Ashley, what, it, what, is, what are those things that, uh, those questions you're, you've been asking these days? everyone. Uh, so I am a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and I'm also cross-appointed at the Royal Ontario Museum, so I'm based out of there. Uh, all of us in Toronto. Uh, and I am interested in the life history and um, sort of growth of cats and their closest relatives. Um, more specifically right now I'm working on the very famous saber-toothed cat called Smilodon fatalis. Um, and then more recently, what I've been doing is starting to look at the Ice Age mammals of the Medicine Hat area in Alberta, uh, trying to untangle what we had there and what they can tell us about how climate was changing at the end of the last Ice Age. So Ashley, Medicine Hat's where you do your field work, I take it, and that's what we're seeing in your background is some of that area? Yes, uh, my background is from some of the field work I did in Medicine Hat uh, this past July. Well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, field work and what that's like, uh, some of the recent places you've been working, and anyone uh, can take it away. Ashley, since your microphone's off, why don't you start and then pick the next person. Sounds great. Um, so give me one second. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. So all of my interest in medicine hat field work uh, sort of came out of the fact that I'm really interested in this famous saber tooth cat. Um, and specifically how I got into the medicine hat uh, Pleistocene mammal game is from this fossil that you can see here. That's a picture of it in my hand. Uh, and what this fossil is, is the only known specimen of Smilodon fatalis from anywhere in Canada. And it's from uh, right in the city of Medicine Hat, uh, really close to the west side of the city. Um, and I described it along with some of my colleagues, uh, Kevin Seymour and David Evans last year. Uh, and then last year as well, we went out to look for more fossils. So some of the really neat things, oops, that's not working. Yay! One sec. All right. Hopefully that works. So one of the really neat things that we have also found there is uh, a possible dire wolf. So this is another really famous Ice Age mammal. Uh, we're currently working on making sure that that's actually a dire wolf and it's not just a really big uh, gray wolf. Um, but one thing that I've been doing recently is sort of going to Medicine Hat and starting to figure out exactly what types of animals we had there and how common they are. Um, we have a huge number of specimens that are at the ROM, uh, thanks to collections that happened in the 1960s. And from those, we know that most of the mammals that we have are horses, um, camels, ground squirrels, mammoths, and bison. So all of these carnivores are really rare, um, which is pretty common for uh, most fossil locations. Usually you get lots and lots of herbivores and not so many carnivores. Um, but one thing that was really weird is that we have a lot of this one type of uh, rodent called a ground squirrel, uh, but only from one of the sites that was looked at. So we think that um, all of these sort of small mammals are probably undersampled. Um, so one of my main things is trying to go back, and this is a photo from when we were back there this July, uh, trying to go back to see if we can get more of those small mammals, uh, maybe get more of those big carnivores that are quite rare, and start to get a fuller picture of um, the 
the mammals that were around in the ice age and how the composition of mammals changed as we go from the last ice age to sort of more current climate. Um, and then the photo that's behind me here is uh, from the site that that uh, Smilodon came from. So it's right along the South Saskatchewan River. It's a beautiful site. You can see there's nice blue skies, something that I haven't seen a lot of recently. <laughs> I think, I think ironically, we just lost your picture for a moment there. We can see it again now, which is nice. Excellent. <laughs> Great. You, I, I probably shouldn't mention that, but sometimes my job in the learning department is to think of the, the common, uh, maybe the, the person who's not so familiar with the topic, but you mentioned ground squirrels, and I did think of the movie Ice Age. Was there not a squirrel in, in that animated series? There, there was. I, it's been a long time since I've watched Ice Age, which is <laughs> somewhat embarrassing considering that I work on Ice Age mammals. Um, sorry? His name is Scrat. Scrat, Scrat. yes. So right. probably appropriate they chose a little ground squirrel considering <laughs> how common they were. Uh, Derek, since your, uh, ca your camera's on, uh, your, your microphone's on, tell us a bit about your field work and how it's different uh, where you are. Sure. So I'm uh, working um, basically on the other end of the uh, province. Um, and we have our, our forest cover a little bit different than in the Medicine Hat area in southern Alberta. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, here we go. And uh, basically, I just want to highlight quickly that the, the work that I'm doing in, in northern Alberta is part of an uh, international effort of scientists. Um, we, we call ourselves the Boreal Alberta Dinosaur Project, or BADP, so we have, uh, I definitely want to thank them while, while I'm here. But uh, this is an example of the type of environment that we're working up. Uh, in the uh, the Wembley and Grand Prairie regions uh, of Alberta. Uh, it's not like southern Alberta, which is relatively devoid of trees. Uh, here we have extensive tree cover. Um, and also, um, it's not necessarily as an ideal place to find uh, fossils as in, as in southern Alberta. So it, it might be uh, a, a bit of a, an odd choice and people might wonder why are we working here and, and given that we have to deal with uh, different uh, adversity like limited outcrop, uh, challenging terrain, uh, working along rivers and other waterways. Uh, but there's several reasons that we do work up here. Uh, one is that uh, due to us being further north than a lot of the other uh, dinosaur sites in North America, um, it provides a little bit of a, a unique picture in terms of the, the uh, environments and latitude um, that were here at that time. Uh, and it also preserves sort of a unique um, uh, time period in history as well. Um, during this time, there was a large seaway that flooded much of, of central North America, including um, several little sites in, in southern Alberta were in fact under, under a, an ocean. And so having, um, having uh, uh, the Grand Prairie record preserved uh, at that time period, preserving the dinosaurs and the things that were living on land is actually quite unique. And uh, uh, locally, the fossils are very abundant in this area as well. So um, just to highlight a few of the things we've been working on, uh, Pipestone Creek Bone Bed is a relatively well-known site from the area. Um, and it preserves uh, Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, a horned dinosaur with sort of a big uh, round, thick pad of bone on its face we call a boss. Um, and right now, uh, the bone bed is one of the densest preserved uh, dinosaur graveyards anywhere in the world. Um, we've excavated at least 34 specimens uh, of the animal, uh, and there's up to 200 bones per square meter. So this is, these are some photos from the site um, working um, to excavate the bones one at a time. Um, and also we have their, their uh, the meat eaters that living in that ecosystem as well. This is an example of a tooth we found last summer, which I was pretty excited about because as I mentioned, I work a lot on fossil teeth and we found this tooth um, at the uh, site. And this is from, from, from one of the raptor dinosaurs that was living at that time. And then quickly highlighting another spot, a new site that was reported by local landowners, again, along a waterway. Um, 
and it required a, a lot of work to get out a single block of rock uh, that contained articulated bones, so bones in light position. Um, and the rock was very hard, requiring a rock saw and lots of effort to get it out of the field. Uh, probably from a duckbill dinosaur, um, like in Montosaurus. And here it is back in the lab. And you can see we actually have several bones. Um, you can see in the bottom left hand corner, um, uh, the vertebrae, the backbones um, that in this case are in the tail are in the uh, bottom left corner. And we've been slowly working away, exposing it from the rock. Um, and you can see again in the bottom left hand corner, it's a very large block and contains a, a number of other vertebrae. And the, this block actually fell off of a piece that's going straight into the hill. So we probably have a complete articulated uh, duck billed dinosaur still uh, in the hill, ready to be excavated. So that's uh, basically a quick summary of the things that I've been working on. There's many more than that, but that's some good highlights. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Derek. Hillary, tell us about where you're working and uh, some of the discoveries or things you've been looking at recently. Sure. So uh, we do all of our field work out in uh, Atlantic Canada, so Nova Scotia. Um, we're fortunate uh, being Canadian in that we actually have one of the only places on the planet that preserves rocks of the right age that are basically showing us snapshots of the earliest phases of terrestrial evolution for the tetrapods. And that's basically all found within Nova Scotia as well as parts of New Brunswick. But the, the, the main areas uh, are within Nova Scotia. And so one of the most famous sites is uh, Joggins, and that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site acknowledged um, because of its fossil significance. So basically that it has yielded the earliest terrestrial reptiles, the earliest um, synapsids and the earliest uh, amniotes in general. So um, it's a really fun place to work. I'll flip into some of our screenshots of what uh, it looks like. Basically, um, where we're looking is along the coastlines. So this is actually the Joggins locality itself. And so this is at low tide right now, fortunately. So I was able to get pretty far out. Um, but basically, when the tide comes in, you know, we're on the Bay of Fundy. So we're dealing with uh, 11, 12 meter tides in August. Uh, so the tide will, the water will come up and eventually crash up against this cliff at high tide. So dealing with the tide is always kind of a bit of a challenge. Um, but on the other hand, what it does for us is provide constant erosion of these cliffs and basically turn over uh, rubble on the beach and reveal uh, the fossil material in both places. So we basically see we prospect the cliffs for uh, what I'll show you as basically these giant trees where we find actually some of the fossils within them and as well as the beach surfaces. Um, so some of the stuff we find on the beaches include things like these trackways. Uh, basically these are footprints of some of the earliest uh, land dwelling vertebrates, uh, basically a little foot pad, uh, my cursor foot pad and a few toes here. Uh, this was another block I found um, a couple years ago. Basically, we can see a trackway feet prints going this way. You can see little toes pointing towards the top. And then this animal actually has a nice tail drag as well. Um, this specimen was also really cool because what's also happening here is we've got one of those giant millipedes, the Arthropleura-like organism, traversing the same track. So there was a little bit of a, of a paleo traffic jam about 300 million years ago when this uh, probably reptile or amniote-like animal was being, uh, its path crossed this um, uh, millipede track. So the other reason why um, Joggins and Nova Scotia is really important in particular is because of this really neat way that uh, fossils are preserved and that is within these uh, giant tree-like trunk structures. So these, this basically right here is um, the sort of lithified infill. So the rock that would have filled in a hollowed out tree trunk um, about 300 million years ago. And basically I use tree loosely because these are not like any of the trees we have alive today. They uh, are not like gymnosperms or the angiosperms that are around us. These basically are more closely related to something like a club moss today. So in the Carboniferous, these would have been extremely large plants that grew in and created these large forests in these swamp-like environments. And at some point when the tree died, basically the inside of it being very soft and pithy, not like a modern tree, hollowed out 
and basically created these natural traps that then sediment washed in and as a result also washed in the bones of these tiny little animals. And so it's within these um, giant tree trunks that we actually find the majority of the fossils uh, uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, we've been able to sort of partner up with some locals in town. This is Brian Hibbert. He is uh, sort of the, the tree whisperer or the, the trunk <laughs> whisperer. He, he can tell you which tree is going to most likely produce uh, some new fossil material and he's got a, a super keen eye for this. He's been doing it his whole life there. He's Joggins native and so he comes out with us now every year and uh, brings some of his high high-tech equipment that we're able to haul those uh, huge tree trunks out of the cliffs and off the beaches. Uh, we have to do it again very quickly because that 11 meter tide is creeping up uh, very quickly. We can, you can actually watch it uh, come towards you just standing there. If anyone's been to Bay of Fundy, you know how quickly the, the tide's coming out. Um, yeah, so that's primarily uh, what we've been doing uh, for the most part out in Nova Scotia. I can show you some of the uh, other fossil material or we can wait for another round if you wish. Yeah, well, let's, let's go to um, Victoria, but while we do that, Hillary, a question has come in uh, asking if you were influenced by Dr. Bob Carroll's work uh, from the Red Path Museum. Do you, are you familiar with him? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So he's my, um, I'm going to try not to choke up, but he's my academic grandfather. So my mm -hmm. supervisor was advised by him. Um, so he was a, a, a huge, a giant in, in my world. So yeah, it was a big loss this week. Oh, I didn't real. Oh, I didn't realize that that was a recent passing. Oh. Yes, yeah, and we actually, uh, it's been a terrible month because we lost Jenny Clack, who was also another very famous paleontologist who worked uh, another locality in Nova Scotia, the Blue Beach locality. Mm. So we've well, got some big shoes to fill. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you know, I think it's such a wonderful, enduring legacy are their grad students who do, as you say, their grand <laughs> they're their grandchildren in a way who carry on that work and, uh, and their yeah. messages. So that's wonderful. Victoria. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow on with that by saying that we're all sort of part of a big paleo family here. So um, Derek and Ashley and, and Hillary and I all know each other and have known each other for a pretty long time, which is why I invited them to come here. So um, I'm really enjoying seeing um, photos of places that I've been to and a couple places I haven't been to. Uh, I'm from Nova Scotia originally, so it's really fun to see what's going on at Joggins, um, even though I find myself out on the West Coast now. Um, so where I work uh, now, um, I've only been there one time, but I work up in the northern part of British Columbia uh, in Spatsizi uh, Plateau Wilderness Provincial Park. I'm going to just call it Spatsizi Plateau, which is a little bit easier to say. Um, and the reason that I work up there is because uh, it's uh, like Derek, <laughs> a lot of British Columbia uh, fossils are found in places that have a lot of trees and paleontologists usually don't like trees because they get in the way of the rocks. Um, so we like to have places where there's lots of rocks like badlands um, or those river cuts, but working along rivers is really hard because there's not as much rock exposed. Um, but if we go up into uh, Northern British Columbia into Spatsizi Plateau, we get up above where trees can grow and there are rocks of the right age to find fossils. So I thought I will also show, um, I'll share my screen and show a couple of photos here. So let's see if I can get this going here. So um, Derek mentioned uh, the uh, Boreal Alberta Dinosaur Project, or Bad P. Um, we are stealing that from our friend and colleague David Evans and Michael Ryan, who uh, started Sad P, which is the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project. So now a bunch of us have this ongoing joke where we make various like acronyms ending in ADP. So uh, my project is Rad P because that's clearly the best iteration of this. Um, and so that's the Remote Alpine Dinosaur Project. So in 2019, I was joined by by our friend Tom Cullen and Jacqueline Richmond, who was working as the collections manager at the Royal BC Museum at the time. And we went up to the mountains and had a, a wonderful time. Um, this is an area we can only get to by helicopter. Uh, it's extremely beautiful, but there's no roads. It's very remote. Um, and so you're really like out there when that helicopter leaves. It's probably one of the places where I've felt like the most 
uh, left behind <laughs> when, when I finally was like, okay, my tent is set up and wow, there is nobody really close by here. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, so we spent about a week um, not really finding very much, to be honest. This is what happens sometimes when you explore new areas uh looking for fossils you might have rocks of the right type and the right age but they still might not have fossils in them um so we went to two spots within spats easy plateau park so we got picked up by the helicopter two times uh and the first place we went to um did not have a whole lot of fossils uh so then we switched to this other spot uh on this beautiful sunny day there's our little tent camp and that wall back along um the back of the photo is where we were um wanted to hike around and look for fossils and uh it's really tough going it's very different from anywhere i've really been before i've spent a lot of time in alberta in environments kind of like what ashley was showing for um medicine hat except a little bit further south um so this is really different. This is basically a big hill full of rubble and we just tried to find bones and after about an hour of hiking around, um, Jacqueline was like, I got a bone and she got a little, little meat eating dinosaur limb bone, like a little chunk of it. And then Tom started to find things. Um, so I'm pointing at one of the bones that Tom found here, which is this white bone sticking into this boulder. Um, but this was this is a very challenging place to work. Those boulders are huge and we didn't really have the tools to get big chunks of rock out because this was just sort of an exploratory um, trip. So anyway, we had this wonderful afternoon uh, where we were like, okay, great, we're gonna, we've got all these fossils, we're, we're gonna find all kinds of great stuff. Um, can't wait to spend the next like three or four days looking for things here and collecting fossils. But the weather doesn't always agree with you because that evening um, the clouds came in and it started to rain. Uh, it rained for a whole day, so we couldn't really go out and look around for things on that very slippery slope. Uh, and then uh, the day after it had rained all day, um, it got very cold, and then it started snowing on us. Um, I also should mention that this was mid-August uh, 2019, so it was not like the winter time. Um, and so it snowed on us for an entire day. The helicopter couldn't come get us. We basically had to just like hunker down. Um, Tom and Jacqueline's tents, which are the green and blue one in this photo, basically collapsed. And so we were all hanging out in my tent, which was the orange one there. Um, and that's just part of the adventure of looking for dinosaurs sometimes. So we did find some, which was very exciting. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and pop back over so that I can, I can see all your friendly faces. And let me get Zoom back up here and see you guys. Get my video going. Yeah, so um, that's that's kind of what happens when you go looking in new places. Um, we're hoping that in a few years I'll have some really cool things to share, like uh, Ashley and Derek and Hillary have shown today. Um, but yeah, so we're sort of at the very beginning of exploration in northern BC, uh, looking for dinosaurs that lived about 67, 68 million years ago. Terry, what's, I mean, you really showed us the glamour of field work there, um, but what is something surprising about um, paleontology in British Columbia that our viewers might be surprised by? I think that one of the things people might be surprised by is the fact that we actually have dinosaur fossils in British Columbia. British Columbia has some very famous fossils, so if you've ever heard of the Burgess Shale, um, that fossil site is found in BC, and it's an incredibly important fossil site, so I'm very proud to live in a province with fossils like that. Um, but I'm a dinosaur researcher, and so I think um, a lot of people don't necessarily realize that we have dinosaur fossils, partly because it's just so hard to go find them, and there aren't a whole lot of them yet, but we now have a unique dinosaur from British Columbia called Ferrosaurus that was named last year. And BC is also absolutely incredible for dinosaur footprint fossils, like the best place in Canada to go look for footprint fossils. So I think that might be something people might be surprised by. I, I know they are, because when I talk to them, they're like, there's no dinosaurs in BC. So we'll work on changing that. Excellent, thank you. I think your, uh, your presentation today gave us a great idea of, uh, <laughs> of how that picture is gonna be changing and I'm sure we'll hear more changes soon. We are at our half hour mark and so some participants uh, may have only planned or be able to stay with us up until this point, but I'm anticipating there's probably a few more questions out there or a few more things you all would like to, to say or to chat about. So if you do have to leave now, uh, of course you're welcome to. This uh, is being recorded and we will post the full recording on our website Website, so you can go back there and check it and or finish watching it at your convenience. But why don't we try unmuting 
if everyone uh, on the panel wants to give that, let's see if we can um, uh, prevent that echo that we had. There is a question here for you, Victoria, about how long you've been doing the remote dinosaur field work. Um, so RADP started in 2017. We went to a place um, in northern BC, not quite as far north, called the Sustut uh, River, Sustut River. Um, and that's when we were looking for more of what would eventually become Ferrosaurus, but who we were referring to as Buster at the time, a little dinosaur uh, related to Triceratops. Um, so that was our first sort of rad P field season. But in terms of the Spatsizi Plateau field work, um, the first season was 2019. The second season was going to be this year in 2020. We'll see what happens. Um, second season might be next year in 2021. Uh, but I'm very excited to get back up there and hopefully have less snow this time. Yeah, so cross our fingers when you do get back. <laughs> From Facebook, Jacob is wondering, um, I'm not sure who's wondering this too, but it said you'd be looking for large main waterways, just like you go out hunting, I would think, some societies of dinosaurs and such. Victoria, you're nodding. I feel like this might be a good question for Derek because he works in an area where there's big bone beds of dinosaurs. Uh, yes. So um, it, it's important to keep in mind that the waterways that are around uh, in modern day are not the same waterways that were present millions of years ago. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about, uh, say, dinosaurs um, uh, drowning in a river and being buried um, a, like what happened at, at the Pachyrhinosaurus uh, bone bed. Um, and it's not the same river that runs through the bone bed today. Uh, there's been millions of years of geological, geological processes happening. The rocks have been buried and subsequently brought to the surface and eroded again. Um, so the, the topography in the landscape has totally changed. Um, but like I said in, in my presentation, um, you need to find rock in order to find uh, dinosaur sites. So uh, uh, definitely in areas that are otherwise uh, grown over with trees or other, other overgrowth, uh, some of the best places to find dinosaur fossils is along riverways and, and the sort of cut banks and cliffs that can form there. Does that answer the question, hopefully? I hope so, that was from Facebook. So we don't have a direct, uh, a direct feed from that from that person. Uh, what are what are something um, you folks are excited about finding next? Anything. <laughs> <laughs> For us, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like Victoria, I feel a, a lot of um, uh, similarities in our field areas, basically just the, the rarity of the material. But when it's found, it's it's so hugely significant that basically we just grasp at anything. Um, I sometimes if I have a small enough team, I will tell my, uh, my team that whoever finds a piece of tetrapod bone will get a lobster dinner. <laughs> so, um, we're pretty hopeful that we just find anything usually it's very rare. Um, yeah, I think I think my dream would be to find an actual saber toothed cat saber. So those big scary canine teeth. In, in real life. I've never found one. Uh, I've never found any bits of any saber-toothed cat. I've only described stuff that was already in museums. So um, having a chance to actually find something like that would just be amazing. Um, sort of more generally right now, we're trying to, um, at the sites that I'm working at, we're just trying to get ourselves oriented. Um, so a lot of what we do in the field is very, um, very contingent on having a good understanding of the geological processes that made the site. Um, and the main site that I'm interested in in the last 30 years has slumped over. Um, so we're sort of starting from not quite from scratch, but we're trying to find um, all of the rock layers that were previously identified, but trying to find them anew out of this absolutely completely new rock face that didn't exist before. I have a, a question here. I have a young learner who's watching and I'm going to turn on uh, their microphone so they can ask a question. Let's see if that worked. William, I think this young learner's with you. Can you? Okay. Um, have, how many ceratopsins are found at the, at the bottom of frozen lakes? What, I mean, empty lakes, which are not empty, you know, that they once had water in it, like because they died when they tried to swim and passed it or something. How many were found? Thank you. 
Um, can I answer that one? Yeah, yes. you should answer that one. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's actually a bunch of different sites um, that have preserved ceratopsians, the relatives of triceratops, uh, all over um, North America and mostly in Alberta. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of different what we call bone beds, uh, sites where multiple animals died together. And we think this is because they lived in herds um, and that when they were trying to cross these treacherous bodies of water, um, in some instances, um, many individuals would, would be drowned and then buried. Um, at our particular site, uh, as I mentioned, we have at least 34 animals. Um, but based on the size of the site and how much we haven't excavated, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of individuals uh, buried at the site. So these were massive, massive herds of horned dinosaurs uh, in the Lake Cretaceous landscape. Okay. Wow. Thank you for asking that question. Well, everyone, thank you for giving us such a great picture of what's happening in paleontology right across Canada. It was a really a treat to see all the different areas uh, and the types of field work that you're working in. Thank you so much um, for joining us and for doing that. And for our participants who are watching, uh, if you want to check out some more, you can try our YouTube channel, the Royal BC Museum YouTube channel, or This Week in History. Um, series is there. There's lots of great presentations on that. And you can also visit the learning portal, including uh, a pathway, a recent pathway called BC's Mountain Dinosaur, which is all about the discovery of Buster, which Victoria mentioned. This series, RBC at Home, takes place on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon. You can join us Thursday for a chat with the curator of botany, Dr. Ken Marr, and we'll delve into ethnobotany. If you have young people at home or in your lives, let them know about RBCM at Home Kids on Wednesdays at 11. This session features a museum educator and our staff members sharing activities you can do at home. And also on Wednesdays, we have a series called Outside at 2 p.m. Uh, all of the links for these programs are posted on the museum's website. So while we wait for better days, I'm happy to have this way to stay connected uh, with the wider community. Thank you all for joining us and please take care of yourselves. Thank you in particular to our, our terrific panel. Thank you everyone.